aside from all the extra blessings and better relationship we obtain from our Maker for faithfully observing His biblical feasts, His holy days, He does expect us to plan ahead wisely as best we can and then we can make up for where we cannot for everything to go as well and smoothly as possible for good health good safety to avoid as much stress as possible as our goal of course to be as blessed as possible to rejoice and learn during his feast as much as we can too and with Sukkot also known as tabernacles as he tabernacles with us in a special way during his appointed time yes it is most challenging it is the most challenging feast for our faith because according to scripture it receives the highest priority for the most consecutive days eight days altogether as a reminder in Devarim the book of Deuteronomy chapter 16 and in verses 13 through 15 it says here seven days you are to keep the feast for Yah your Elohim in a place Yah your Elohim will choose because Yah your Elohim will bless you in all your crops and not just agriculture but all your work I think he understood back then there would be more than agricultural work so that we all will be full of joy when we do it right when we do it his way the best we know how the best we can and that's an improvement process through our life for observing all seven days there plus there's that eighth day as you can read about in the context and in, in, in the Torah and in a number of places in Deuteronomy and also in Leviticus 23 and elsewhere and notice he says in a place that he chooses to bear his name you see bearing his name and a place he chooses in Deuteronomy chapter 14 and verse 24 we'll go to that later a little bit and this requires faith yes it's hard to do it without faith the people who don't have much faith don't do it or they'll do part of it uh, obedience is is a, a reaction to our faith it's a result of our faith of course as many of us know as we are to be living sacrifices of faith and as we see in Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 and simply as a disclaimer let me throw in there of course obeying one commandment or just a few doesn't guarantee us anything or earn us anything but so I don't want to go off on a tangent too much but with this in mind how can we best plan ahead wisely for each one today in our times with everything that we have to deal with in our times in our modern times to, for everything to go as well and smooth and stress-free and, and blessed as possible which leads us to my title and presentation here of Sukkot Wisdom Tips and a little subtitle here is plan for the best feast ever if that be possible by observing these feasts for over 40 years myself I think I have some good wisdom tips for you out there and if you can think of any others then take notes and make comments on this video teaching or send an email out but first of all let's ask for wisdom persistently in everything including keeping his peace how do we do it right get advice and wisdom from others there's also seeking wise and abundant counsel as we see in the, in the Proverbs uh, listen to people and correspond with people who've been doing it for years and that's not in my notes here but that's a good one to add and insert in there as well some scriptures that show that but here in the book of James chapter 1 verse 5 the original Hebrew name 2,000 years ago Yaakov it says here if any of you lack him, let him ask of Yah who gives to all liberally 
and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Verse 6, but let him ask in faith. Yes, we need faith. With no doubt. And you know it's his will, and he commands it. And it's about loving him, and a better relationship with him and others. Yes, we should have no doubt. And for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that person, Greek and Hebrew is a masculine feminine language, so you'll see in the King James Version here, man, but it's also including women as well. Let that person suppose that he or she will receive anything from Yah, the Lord. Verse 8, he or she is a double-minded person, unstable in all their ways. As I reward this a little bit myself, so perhaps we all have some room for improvement in this regard. I think myself included. Room also for agape love improvement too. So agape is the Greek word for love, but it's this type of love that goes beyond brotherly love, as we say, or philia, or also eros, it's the romantic type of love, but this is a love between our maker, our creator, and human beings like ourselves, as well as it relates to our relationships with one another. This is like a really deep form of, of love that uh, the Greek language in the New Testament really emphasizes as being even at a higher level than just a brotherly love. Blood is thicker than water, but when you come into the faith, into the body, water should be thicker than blood. It's involved of the spirit being born, entering that body, faith. So we're talking about those who are called out, and many of us come from very different religious backgrounds, some no religious backgrounds, atheists coming to faith, and but new feast keepers, like taking baby steps, just learning and growing. Everyone you know, being sincere believers, sacrificing a lot to obey him. This takes a lot to keep all eight consecutive days. It's not during the summer vacation time. This is time when a lot of people have work and school. So it takes faith both for adults and children. As I've been keeping these feet since I was eight years old, I know how it is. Uh, growing up, going to elementary school, high school, middle school, college, and keeping these feet in all eight days. And as a reminder, as it says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2, If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries, and all knowledge. And if I have all faith. Ooh, wow, faith, yes. Wonderful. Well, so as to even remove a mountain. Anybody out there got that much faith? No. Nope. But if I don't have love, this is that agape word, the, the Greek concordance, strong concordance number 26, is I am nothing by comparison to what is really important. To creator. When we compare this agape love to all these other wonderful things, like knowing all the mysteries, the knowledge, and faith, and continuing in verse 3, if I give away all that I own, okay, let's give all to the poor, and let's go out there and help everyone, and do all this good and works that a lot of Christianity does, that's wonderful, and if I ha hand over my body, it says here, as, as a literal sacrifice, persecution or martyrdom. And so, uh, you know, wow, I can even boast about that, he said. But if I have not agape, it's love. I gain nothing. So, love is very important. The whole chapter is known as the love chapter. Then, I also notice in verse 26 of Genesis 1, it says, then Elohim said, let us make man in our image, after our own likeness. So this is important to keep in mind that everyone's made in his image. And that takes a, a lot of respect. Because we, we, the way we treat others is the way we're also treating him. 
the world made in his image. So it's important to remember that during these times with people coming from different religious backgrounds and some different beliefs, especially new people coming out of different forms, Christianity, Judaism, uh, and other religions. This agape love includes, let me add, respecting different sincere beliefs, especially at the beginner levels of, of observing the code and being together for at least consecutive days and all the different backgrounds that people are coming from, dysfunctional ones and functional ones, being patient with one another, having those fruits of the spirit we see in, in that Ephesians and somewhere love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, gentleness, meekness and and so forth. I don't have that in my notes here, but let's also consider dressing modestly and nicely when you're at the feast. It doesn't have kind of drawing lines here, but let's remember that you're in the presence of our Maker and others. A sincere belief and faith. Among fellow royalty, if I might put it that way, we're all called to be training, to be leaders, kings, a royal priesthood. As it says in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, not to be competitive or to, to think that we're better than others. You gotta be careful of that when we're there. It's easy to do that, and that causes a lot of frustration and, and divisions and comfortable with people who are sacrificing a lot to be there. And so, dressing modestly. Is, is a way that we need to consider other people's feelings and how we're affecting others and then considering kindly the spiritual, mental, physical, potential weaknesses of others and or potential lack of spiritual maturity of others. So you can go there anticipating that. And there's also that scripture that there's going to be tears among the weak. And we've got to be careful of pulling out tears or being too heavy-handed really affects the good weed in a negative way and pulls out some of that. So there's that parable to consider that's not in my notes as well. But there's there's other people there. We don't want to cause them to stumble. And remember Shaul, Paul's elite example of not eating kosher meat. This is my understanding of the epistles and the whole teachings on that. I don't want to get on a tangent with this video teaching. But when he was around others, who might get offended or not. He didn't want to cause offenses or unnecessary divisions. Uh, for example, in Romans chapter 14, he's talking about doubtful, ambiguous issues. Right right there in verse 1 of chapter 14. I have a whole YouTube teaching on Romans 14 to help explain that and how he uses the Greek word koinos, not archithartos how we need to understand those Greek words, understand what he's talking about. He's not talking about anything that's against the written Torah commandments, like Sabbath, dietary food laws. Nevertheless, he would not eat meat, even if it would cause someone to offense. And our Messiah also warned about offenses, and offending even the little ones, the newcomers, the babes, in, that are coming into the faith. And he says in, in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 6, you know, saying that it would be better to cast yourself into the ocean and not you know, a stick a stone to yourself and to drown yourself. It would be better to do that than offend one of these little ones. And of course, he's using an extreme example. It's horrible to drown and, and die that way, and none of us would want to. So he's using this extreme comparison to say that we should have that same type of fear and feeling of, of, of offending other people unnecessarily. And also, what uh, we do it to others, we're doing it to him. You know, we can go to Matthew chapter 25, verse 37 through 40, and look at the context more of that. And see that uh, when we are doing things to others, that whether it's good or bad, that we are also doing it to him. And then also with that, the fact in mind that we are all created in his image and likeness. One degree or another, that we are to grow and develop that more on a spiritual level, on a 
maturity level. And always remembering how patient he is with us. Even though we've got our issues. And we've got our imperfections and that we're working on. And also, for some wisdom here, ties to support financial feasting. We see that in the Torah. In the Torah, it says there in, in Devarim, Deuteronomy 14, verses 24 to 26. But if the journey is too long for you so that you are not able to carry the tithe, or if the place where Yah, your Elohim, chooses to put his name, here's that scripture where you, you want a place where he puts his name, and notice he's not just saying Jerusalem here, because he's leaving room for interpretation and knowing the future, that he's going to be wanting it to be kept elsewhere around the earth, not just the physical Jerusalem, Israel, the land only, physical land only. But he says that it's too far from you. When Yahweh Elohim has blessed you, you've been blessed enough to go do it, then you, you can exchange. If it's agriculture or something that's not money, he says, take the money in your hand and go to the place which Yahweh Elohim chooses. And you shall spend that money for whatever your heart desires. Of course, not referring to sins. I'm not talking about disobedience to the commandments. But within the liberty of his law, his Torah, his commandments. There's freedom to enjoy, to be happy uh, during this time. And, and a little bit of alcohol without getting too drunk and, and in moderation can, can boost your, your joy, your rejoicing too. No scripture on that. But he says, for whatever your heart desires, you shall eat therefore before your Yah, your Elohim, you shall rejoice, you and your household. Of course, household is young. To do it and go with you peacefully. But uh, oh, some people ask, well, what if there are too many locations to choose from? There's so many groups out there locally and wonderful places to go. Some people have a hard time deciding that. What do I say about that? Well, go where you are needed the most. I would, that's like one thing I choose from. Where am I needed the most? Where can I make my talents multiply the most and help others, and serve others with my gifts and the spirit and the talents that I have? As well as, if that's not an issue, uh, that it can be pretty much equal in these choices that you have, uh, well, how about where you think you might be able to learn the most or obey him better and, and rejoice the most. Of course, knowing the people that are going there is helpful to make those decisions, but you know, sometimes obedience to financially. You don't want to go deep into debt and make it too hard to pay. Uh, so how can you better keep the Torah? There is a commitment that don't borrow from the nations, uh, and pay interest to the nations. And, uh, if we can you know, help each other out, even we can give loan to each other without any interest. That's not permissible. If it's still difficult with this in mind, then pray about it more. Even fast about it. For it's a difficult decision for you. But it's comforting to know that you can use some of the Creator's tithes that belong to Him. 10% of your annual increase can be used for feasting too, not just for ministry that you support, you know, elderly, poor, widowed. Nevertheless, uh, there's three times a year, time periods, I put, per year, that these fees come upon. Not including the, the weekly Moed, you mean the, the weekly Sabbath, of course, but there's three times that these annual ones come. As it says in, in Deuteronomy, 17, 16, 16, and, and other places elsewhere in the written Torah. It says, three times a year, all your males shall appear before every your Elohim in a place which he chooses. Of course, back then, when they didn't have stadiums and sound systems and modern technology to make it easier for huge, large groups, and mega groups. So now, you know, back then, even Israel, when they came out, there was, was 600,000 men just coming out of Egypt. And now as they multiply as time went on with their big families growing. So 
you know, that we could see elsewhere in scripture. It's not just nails that, that you know, everyone in the household, is that previous scripture I mentioned, this is at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, there's that Passover time, which is Pesach, Hebrew, that whole time period, at the Feast of Weeks, also known as Shavuot, Pentecost in the Greek language, and at the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, is the fall feast, and, and you clump in all the fall feasts in the seventh month there. And it says, and they shall not appear before Yah, the holy name there, and come before him, our maker, he shall not do that empty handed. Impossible. Every one shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of Yah, your Elohim, which he has given you. Notice that, according to the blessing. And uh, if you can keep it, you don't have anything to give, or you can get some help and assistance, that's wonderful too. But here you're to give as you're able, not just emotionally. You try to work out people's emotions to give more than they are able. And it says in Second Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. In that concept, we cannot give our creator, of course. In right ways, but you, you got to do it in wisdom. It says in verse 7, So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. You feel obligated to give more than you can afford. For Yah loves a cheerful giver. He loves it when we're doing it cheerfully and we're doing it faithfully and according to his will and what we feel is best and affordable. Not just pushing it emotionally. For his promised feast blessings. Of course. So let's go down a little list here I have. Number one, during his appointed ordained timing. As you see, hinted best, as many of us know in Genesis, that is sheet one, chapter 14, he put these lights in the firmament. Tell us days and years and Moedim, the festivals and the feasts. And then he starts explaining them as you go through the scriptures more. When they happen and where they happen, as best you can, as best possible, if you get to Jerusalem, great. But wherever he chooses for you, and to remember, as we mentioned in Deuteronomy, to bear his name. And you got to know that by the fruits. Study who you're going, research a little bit if you don't know much about the people you're going to keep it with. And number three here, to give an offering at each as we have been blessed and able, not so emotionally as many, many ministries work it out to try to get, to get more emotional. But also remembering that we are living sacrifice. The little sacrifice here that's mentioned in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, to, to present ourselves in a special way, in every way that we can, according to His Word and His commandments. Of course, uh, not willful sin. You better remember that. We shouldn't be willfully sinning. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, 25, if we willfully, premeditate, defiantly, sin after receiving the knowledge of the truth and, and there's that danger of the sacrifice is not no longer covering our sins so you have to kind of keep that in mind just just keeping the feast alone in, in these conditions is not going to guarantee you blessings there's there's a, there's seven points that i have here number five is loving the truth you have to love the truth not rejecting it in any obvious way that he holds you accountable for Remembering Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse ten and eleven, it says, "Because they did not receive the love of the truth, that our Creator sends a strong delusion, the test." And there's other scriptures that say that yes, He will send false prophets to test us, and and so He does that to see if we love the truth. Are we going to compromise? Are we going to be influenced? And where are our priorities? What's more important to us? Is it just a social problem? Or worship, 
or do we look to the materialism, the wealth of ministry is too much, and we get influenced by that, or the majority, or the numbers being greater, influencing us more than the truth, when it's brought to us and revealed to us. Point number six, those who are on a learning curve, yes, if we're on a learning curve, improving year by year, like baby steps for many who are new, then we see, even in Acts chapter 17, verse 30, that he overlooks times of ignorance to a degree. He looks over, looks it, and yeah, we still may get punishments for making mistakes, not following his way, but he's more merciful, and he overlooks ignorance. And, and as we learn, as we grow, he expects more out of us you know, year to year. Some people just fear learning and growing because they don't want to help us. They fear that. And that's dangerous because then you're willfully not doing good, which he wants us to improve and to multiply. And more like him. That's what this is all about. Building his character, loving him and loving each other. Those two great commandments, all the four. And the, and the prophets are based upon loving him and loving one another. Point number seven, you know, too much is given, much is expected. Among faithful servants and kingdom leaders. Those who are called to be leaders in his kingdom. Have you seen that parable? Right? The parable but much is expected in Luke chapter 12. Keeping these points in mind to receive his promised blessings during his feast. Now let's cover the issues of reliable transportation and let's try to predict difficulties. Point number one on this slide is uh, the pre-feast time period. It's easy to get too busy and to have not have our vehicles double checked. We should double check the vehicles that we're taking, make sure there's enough oil, clean oil, maybe it needs change, water, how about water and radiator, brakes, you know, the last time you got your brakes, so the brakes in good shape to handle in the time period that you're gone, and your tires, and, and other maintenance issues, you know, an ounce of prevention can be worth a pound of cure, if you will, idiom, saying goes. Budget, your projected costs in advance, grocery shopping, Daily food, restaurants, if you want to go out to restaurants and drinks, and storage, you know, where are you going to store it? If you're going to have your own, store it in the, in the place, your accommodation, where you're staying at the temporary dwelling place, that's what a sukkah is, a, 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 a tabernacle, is a temporary dwelling place. Is there enough space for everything? How, how about extra activities? You know, if you want to have some cost for extra activities, souvenirs, gifts for others, and so forth. Think about that and come up with a list of that. Now also there's, you know, it's best to stock up on uh, quick, easy breakfasts. That's important too. Because for early morning gatherings, some people 10 o'clock is super early, 10.30. But uh, some of them might get together earlier, but whether that be early or not, having a quicker, easier breakfasts, get on the road, or get to where you're gathering with others, make it light and easy lunches, uh, more afternoon activities, and restaurants, what I recommend if you're going out to restaurants, that's better to do in the evening with others on the non-Sabbath times, of course, and during Shabbat, during Holy Time, you have to buy or sell, it's possible, you know, it's always Oxers in the ditch, there's always issues beyond their control. Be careful though, just because he gives it an inch, let's not take it a mile. But, you know, before and after sunsets of these Sabbaths that are coming up in the holy days, plan ahead and look at those and plan how you're going to handle all that. Also, there's pre feast packing, a uh, checklist. Make a checklist if you can to minimize shopping and expenses when you get there, right? Bring some toiletries, some clothes, a shower, towels if, if, if you're camping and, and you're not in a, in a place where they provide towels for you. Prepare for all weather conditions and possibilities. Weather can really change in the fall quickly. Going from hot to cold, rain, snow, you know, experience the bad weather, usually the day after the eighth day. And uh, usually during those eight days, I've always been my experiences. I, I can't remember bad weather patterns or, 
and disrupting or the feast, always just before and afterwards, so much blessing, praying, fasting beforehand, and even uh, that feast beforehand, you know, before the Day of Atonement. There's laundry, okay? Or, do you need to do laundry? I find it best to bring enough clothes for all eight days. If you're a big family, it's hard. So, but some clothes, you can wear more than one in one day. Right, like pants and shorts, if you don't get them too sweaty or dirty, you can wear them more than once without doing laundry. But some clothes need changing every day, right? Like socks. I'm not going to go down a list of that, but you can figure that out for yourselves. Uh, if laundry you know, need cleaning, well, designate a group unity three times for low activity time. Or figure it out where your group is having low activity time and try to do that when there's nine big activities where people are getting together and doing great things. In the piece that I have any leadership with, that I try to encourage a certain free time, afternoon time, times when people can do those, the laundry if they need to, or go shopping when they need to. We'll be doing that in Yosemite at the Sukkot, we'll be doing there. We'll be having some free time like on Friday afternoon for the weekly Shabbat. Also Sunday afternoon will, will be time before the eighth day this year in 2019 and so forth. So these are all little tips to, for planning ahead and also during the feast for better unity and to maximize your time there to have the best time possible with others and with family, for family bonding and with the spiritual family, the Mishpacha, not just physical. Expect everything to take longer than expected. That's one of my mottos. Uh, it just seems like everything. Not everything. But so many things. It seems like everything. But expect things to take longer. Like what kind of things? Transportation. To and from locations. Uh, before and after. Service and feast during this eight-day eight time period. And especially arriving to these gatherings on time the best you can. And just get a little early and and talking and fellowship. Also, before and after the eight days, traveling there, expect uh, things to take longer than you expect. You know, roll with the punches and, and still rejoice it. Anyway, remember the command to rejoice, even though things might get a little difficult or stressful or taking longer than expected. Electronic communication. You know, we're in an age where we need our communication. So, you know, media, social media. Addictions, workaholics, you know, keep them on track of their work and you know, their type of job, do that through media. So, depending on where, you know, there's cellular coverages, Wi Fi, speed access, you know, some of these issues can cause problems and difficulties, but it's not always good for, like I said, the social media addicts and you know, the workaholics. And maybe that's a good thing. Get away from it. I think it's hard to do get back to the work group stuff. Even, but if you need to, and it's important to check in and make sure there's no emergencies. And everybody's different. Let's not judge each other. Uh, understand that there's, uh, there's room for, uh, for differences between us in these areas. So just kind of plan ahead. Think ahead of that. If you're new to all this especially. And then there's students out there. If you have, a, if you have homework and you're a student, regardless uh, inform and obtain from your teachers in advance. This is very important if you're a student of any level, elementary, middle school, high school, college. Try to get as much done before and after the feast days. It is difficult even during those non Sabbath times. It's so much fun and so much excitement. So if you can get this in advance, and when I was in college, I would take the most difficult classes, the most complicated classes I wanted to and gift it in, in the spring. In the fall, especially as, as school starting and as feast comes, you don't want to get too far behind. So I'd take the classes that I was more gifted with, better at, and keep up with better and with that time off. And back then, they didn't have internet and email. So nowadays, you, you can kind of do that and keep up with other students, even that you're friends with, so that aren't keeping the peace, and then the teacher as well. But we want more family. As I 
which are Mishpacha bonding time, which is a good thing. More time for prayers and connecting in his creation. You're in a place of that epic, exotic, Hawaii, Yellowstone, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, there's other places. I've been down under in Australia. There's wonderful places you can get out in his creation. Just for little breaks with prayers and connecting with him. Some alone time as well as gathering with others. Uh, worship and fellowship. Everyone can just always remember, everyone can make a big difference for others. How can you make a big difference for others? Not just yourself. You go there for yourself more than anything, then you might get disappointed. If you go there for others, you might be surprised how much better everything goes. And that's just some wisdom. There's a couple tips here to add to that. And because it's easy to get lost in time. Not just lost in space, <laughs> wherever space you're at. But in this time and place that he placed his name. But time goes by so fast, as they say, when you're having fun. And yes, the first half of those eight days seems like it's, you got plenty of time, and then all of a sudden, boom, you hit that halfway point, it just goes too fast. And remember, time flies, yes, when you're having fun. Rejoicing has come handy. Is there anything else? Anything else to say? Well, to offer more wisdom and advice for others. Can't think of any for now. I've been planning this out for a little while, but for any Q&A for anyone out there or comments, if you want to add some wisdom that I haven't addressed well enough or that I haven't addressed at all, well, you can, you know, of course, I, like I mentioned here, there's much prayer and fasting beforehand. That's important. Yes, important to do, not just Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. If you can fast even more so within the month or two beforehand. For everything that I've discussed here, weather, time, place, the spiritual and physical rejuvenation. Vacation, as we say, his vacation. I have also a YouTube teaching on that. So comment on this video if you want, or send emails to us here at graftinto at gmail.com. And we're glad to respond to that. Perhaps I will record a part two on this topic of Sukkot wisdom tips. Especially if any of you have any more out there to add to it that I haven't thought of, or if any more comes from... Thank <laughs> you.